so I was I was born and I grew up in Senegal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like the 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 most western point of the entire African continent. Um, meaning that we were we were like the the, the last Africans to see the sunset. Um, and I guess I had a pretty normal childhood. Like I I I grew up on a diet of comics and movies and video games and all of that. But the main issue I had was access for a lot of it. Basically, you had to rely on what you had on TV and the very few things you could buy. Um, like my, my point of reference was always France. And in France, you would have these huge um, malls or you would have special specialty shops that only sold comics, for example. Whereas I had one library that sold a bunch of different kinds of books. So they had a small selection of comics and you would sort of have to make do with whatever is there. Um, So I had a sense of what existed, but I had a few comics, a few um, movies. And TV was a big tool for me because it allowed me to discover a bunch of different stuff. Um, and, and, but, but a, a regular experience growing up was opening a magazine and learning about books or shows or movies or, or even exhibits and stuff like that, that would happening, that would be happening in France and I could not see. So, yeah, so I had, I had enough to like, to, to, to work off of and manga was the best discovery because the manga community on the internet is, it's so active because they share so much, um, like the scans and everything, I spend most of my teenage years reading manga because that's what was most available to me. Which and manga then, did you like? Uh, I always uh, quote uh, Full Metal Alchemist and Shaman King as my two favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, like those are those are the biggest the, the biggest like the ones I was most into. The was the ones I cared most about, and the ones that blew me away in terms of artistry as well so yeah so th- those two are probably at the top of the list for me but, like there's a whole list of books that i enjoy so it's, it's kind of difficult to like um but yeah so it must... the, the art of it or the right or the writing of it or just the experience uh... all, all of it like it, it's there are certain things for example that i would read or, or watch where i enjoy the world or the characters but i don't necessarily pay much pay much attention to how it's made Mm. and and vice versa whereas those two books and i had that with other books as well but those two are at the top for me because i was so into what was going on but i was also paying a lot of attention to how it was drawn how the paneling was handled and the design of everything like a lot of of the stuff that i do now is a result of me observing them for so long Mm. so yeah the the and then I really started getting into American type comics when I was in my late uh, teen, yeah, in my late teens, uh, through Hellboy first. And then I started getting into Marvel comics. And from then I started discovering dif- different artists and writers. And then I moved slowly from reading a lot of superhero stuff to reading a lot of indie stuff. So I got to the point now where I barely read uh, superhero books anymore, and and I I tend to enjoy the, the more indie side of things a lot more. <coughs> so yeah, I think that's a fair assessment of like the development of it. Um, mostly over the years, I got better and better access. I would say is is the, the best way to summarize like what it was like for me growing up. Get, 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 getting a bit of frustration. I talked to uh, one of the previous episodes was uh, with is the brain author who lives now in uh, Scotland called Tendai mm-hmm. Uchu, and he said, you know, when the thing most people don't think about is when you write a book for, for example, Zimbabwe, most people, you know, there isn't a real uh, middle class the way there is in, say, the UK or the US or in France. Yeah. Uh, and so there aren't enough people who can buy the books or can buy enough books. So that, uh, uh, it's the same thing with comics, I'm sure, you know. Uh, 
uh, yeah. what you're describing. Sounds yeah. Like the same thing. Like the, the, the comic book industry in Senegal is pretty much non-existent. So I grew up on a, like, I knew that there was at least one Senegalese comic book that existed, but I never actually managed to get my hands on it. Mm -hmm. And, and so all the media that I grew up with was largely Western. Uh, and, and like things have gotten much better now because like when I was a kid, things were very much like being born. Today, Senegal has like multiple TV channels and their own TV shows and they make TV shows that are so popular that the entire African diaspora watches it, at least the francophone ones. Uh, so things have changed, like things have changed a lot since I was a child. You talk a lot about uh, folklore and myths. Uh, and how did you get into that? Was that as a child? Uh, comic books? No, no, folklore, myths, old oh. stories, like ancient stories. Uh, I've always liked, I was, I've always liked that aspect. Not just the African side, just every every folklore of every culture. Um, but it's more so that I didn't have much of an interest in it when I was a kid. Like the African folklore, I didn't have much of an interest in it when I was a child. I think because I was living in it, and. When I was looking at the folklore from Japan or Russia or other places in the world, it felt new and different and fun and exotic and all that stuff. Um, but then when I started growing older, I, I started just wondering why don't I do the kind of stuff that Japanese creators have been doing with their own folklore in their manga? Why don't I do the same thing with my own stuff that I know because I grew up with it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and from then on, it started becoming sort of a journey of discovery, even for myself, to like sort of just buy books, uh, read old folk tales and the um, cultures they came from, like learning the history of how those cultures came to be and, and the empires and kingdoms that they were. And, and like, it was great. Like I, I learned a lot about sort of demystifying the past, not imagining it as some kind of perfect place or a horrible uh, hell hell uh, on earth. So like, I just, I just, it gave me some kind of perspective, I guess. And, and I, I've discovered that I, I tend to have folklore from all kinds of different places in my work because I, vibe a lot with with folktales for some reason i think it's because the storytelling is a very specific um it has a very archetypal style where the characters all represent something um the stories sometimes have a point sometimes they don't but the structure is, is always very simple and some very often very symbolic as well and I, I like playing around with those tools, I think. Like the, the, I really like reading a, a story and seeing a character on a journey and he has to pass, say, three challenges. And even the fact that there are three challenges is a symbolic number that means something. And I, I, I enjoy that stuff. Like there's layers to, to, to the folktale uh, style of storytelling. It's, it's, it's true that... I think because folk tales are the stories that last the longest, like they, they, they pass, you know, from parents to from generation to generation for yeah. hundreds and thousands of years sometimes. And so they all, in all countries, they, first of all, they have like a basic structure of storytelling. Once mm -hmm. upon a time, there was uh, this. Yeah. Let me tell you the story of how the sun was like this. And yeah. Okay, so you used a lot in, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, mostly because it's uh, it's very often a way to sort of convey information, even about real life to people through those types of stories. So like I was talking with a friend a few days ago about how our parents would tell us go out in the sun at noon because some monster is going to try and kidnap you. And it was just a way to keep you away from the sun at the very time where it could be um a danger to your health and and it, it, it's it's like she compared it to the type of stories that she heard in like the north of france uh where if you strip away the, the mystical things the base uh moral of the stories and and the creatures was 
don't trust strangers, don't uh, venture around at night alone, that, that, that stuff that you can just use in your everyday life, basically. Yeah. But always dressed in, 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 a, in, a, in a garment of fantasy, which is what I like about it. I love, I love the fact that you can sort of convey messages through fantasy, because even just a creature has a very specific idea attached to it. And I like that. And it's also, usually those are stories that also explain, some of them are like uh, European fairy tales, which, t- which have a lesson, but some of them are tales about how the world came to be. Uh, yeah. Why are things the way they are? And, you know, this God was angry at that God, and that's why we have storms. And, you know, yeah. Um, and, and the, the, and the story and the, there's nothing really complex in it, in you know character development or stuff. It's the yeah. most basic thing that survives over the generation. Mm-hmm. It's the least you can do to tell a really good story. Uh, yeah, and, and it's a good base as well because like you can have one tale, give it to two different people, and they're going to bring some of themselves into it. Yeah, and even though they have the same base, they can have they can tell the same story in two diff- di- completely different ways. And that's where we get to the storyteller uh, himself and herself. In, uh, um, I think there are people who have the ability to storytell. Mm. They talk, other people listen. When they tell a tale, you know, your world disappears and you just sink into it. And I saw that in Jelia, you had the storyteller is a major character and she is the yeah. one who uh, who's like who, who who always solves the problem? She's the heroine, yeah. Because and she's you know in in superhero stuff, she would be the superhero, and mm-hmm. she's the storyteller, yeah. And that seems to me like that is very important to you. Can you talk about storytelling? Yeah, yeah. So when I started working on this, I wasn't exactly sure what the story itself was going to be about. Um, but then when I found, well, not found, like I knew they existed already, but, but when I started reading on the, the, the jelly, I figured there was an opportunity there to talk about the effect of stories on, on people on an individual level, but also on a societal level. Like how, how can someone who has basically access to media, how do they manufacture an identity and 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 um, a sense of self both for people and for the entire society at, at large and like what what kind of power does that give you and what kind of responsibility do you have because of that kind of power and how i was basically born out of the aspect of my brain that very much wants to um that tends to think he knows better than everyone and I and, that, yes <laughs> and I, I, I thought it would be interesting to have a character who was raised with a very specific set of ideas about how the world is supposed to be. She has the power to convey those, those ideas to people in such a way that she could affect great change. But if she doesn't ever question what she was taught, she's just going to parrot things without ever thinking about why she was told stories the way they were. Mm-hmm. And so I, I really wanted to have a story where she, she gets to travel and see the effects of what the generations before her did uh, the kind of stories that they made and told her and just expected her to repeat without questioning so it's essentially a story about someone who learns to question what she was given uh, and and learns that maybe there is um, other ways to construct a society beyond what she was told is the normal thing to do because mm-hmm. like even the prince serves when you start the book, you really think the prince is the, the main focus because that's what you usually expect in stories like this. The kingdom has fallen, the, the king is dead, the prince needs to take the throne and, you know, the, the usual stuff. And, and I thought it would be interesting to have, to basically have the sidekick be the one who's like, actually, I have a better solution. And the prince himself says, maybe I'm just not made for this type of work. I don't want to be king and it's not for me. And it corresponds to a certain idea of what a man is that I don't really see myself in 
So yeah, there was a lot of, of my own questions, I guess, put into this book. Interesting. I, I, I didn't want to jump ahead to the book. I just wanted to, to cover like the base because folklore is something that repeats uh, in your work. And I wanted to cover the basis of that. So yeah. let's go back in time to like, how did you get then into, how did you start as a comic book creator? Oh boy. Uh, um, did you start as something else? No, uh, I, I started drawing when I was a kid and, and I decided that I wanted to do illustration, I guess, when I was 11. Um, and from then on, it was more of a grind of like, try to figure out where you fit, what kind of stuff you can do, what kind of what style you want to have, um, and, and who's going to hire you. Um, so I went to, I went to two art schools here in France and started sort of shopping around the stuff that I was doing. Um, and I found Kugali almost right away. So that was a good platform, but I also used, uh, Twitter a lot with like the, the, the first few stories that I made and it attracted enough attention that gradually I started getting more and more offers. So like covers, short comics here and there. And uh, I signed on Delia specifically because I sent a message and they said, um, we don't usually take offers, but in your case, we've seen what you were doing before. So you, you want to see what you have to offer now. So like being able to post things on, <coughs> on the internet has been really beneficial for me because it basically showed people what I was able to do. So when I started shopping around uh, publishers, I really just had to send the message to one American publisher after like three years of trying in France and failing. I sent one message to one American publisher who just happened to know what I was doing and they said yes. And, and in the meantime, I started getting attention from other companies. So now I, I'm on a steady production schedule of working with um, my own stuff and also short shortcomings for different publishers. Uh, covers stuff like that like i'm i've been working with dc pretty steady for like a month or two doing what um even more than a month or two uh i've done an issue of truth and justice where i draw a 30 pages of a, an, an adventure of robin um i'm on another uh robin story um that's set to come out in Batman The Radio Adventures, I think it's called. And then I did 10 pages on Joker Puzzle Box and then covers for Batman The Animated Adventures. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like names of covers that I've done that are actually out. Mr. Miracle, because like I've done a bunch that are not out yet. So I'm trying to like not uh, spread too much information. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I've I've been doing covers for various people. I've done two covers for the for the Ninja Turtles, um, five or, or six covers for Boom Studios. So yeah, the, the, there's a there's a bunch of stuff now. That's on top really of my, nice. That's a... yeah. yeah, I'm pretty yes. happy. Yeah. And wow, that's and that was like in how many years ago was your first publication? Um. I guess Jelia is my first graphic novel, so that would be this year. Um, but before then, everything else I was doing was stuff that I was doing like Kugali and and on my on myself. So everything else that you would see of me that was published in a in a traditional sense would be covers. So I think I did a variant cover for, for the Excellence uh, series for Skybound. Yeah, no, I, no, 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 I, this is, what, what? <laughs> you have, there's the, um, the, uh, the comic book at Pugali. Yeah. Which I've, I've read, the one, uh, and there's the one that I couldn't find, the one, oh, Kain and Abeni. Yeah. Uh, when did those take place? Like, um... So that one happened right after I was out of school. So that would be 2017, maybe. Um, yeah, 2016, 2017, I think. Um, and 
it was mostly because I had a co-writer for like the first issue. Um, and it was mostly a way for us to test stuff. Uh, especially, can, can, can you tell a little bit about what, what the story is and then what did you test? So, uh, so the base concept was to make a sort of sci-fi uh, series inspired by West African aesthetics um, about two cousins who lost their kingdom and are trying to get revenge against the pirates who killed their parents. Uh, but then every issue was a self-contained adventure and I only made three, mostly because uh, Kenan, the co-creator the co -creator of it, left after the first issue. I made two more and I got tired and I was already working on, on Jelia. So I just figured I'm, I'm going to stop this and go back to what I was actually doing before Kenan approached me with this. Um, was that, I, guess, I, I remember I, I had an in, another interview with uh, Tolu from uh, Tolu Lufueco from uh, Kogali, yeah. uh, like just before the pandemic started in another podcast. And he showed me, I remember the, the picture, he showed me a picture of, uh, I can uh, the name always gets you, Kain and Abeni. Uh -huh. I, I know because I recognized it when I saw it again and he told me this is based on this uh, like he, he explained to me how everything is based on actual African uh, law yeah. and but I didn't see this book in the Kugali website right? Yeah um, I took it down okay uh, mostly because a lot of the aesthetic elements were stuff that I was working on for Delia and that I tested on Cain and Ebony. That was the thing is, Cain and Ebony wasn't supposed to be, it wasn't supposed to take the size it, it took. It was literally just supposed to be a quick thing that I did on the side for myself while I was uh, on an internship uh, in France. But then I posted it on the internet and it grew very quickly and, and people started asking for more. and like it, it, it got way more attention than it was supposed to. So before it created too much of an image of itself, because I was using so much of it for Delia, yeah. I, I decided to back it out and and basically take the take the stuff out and and that, that, is, the that is a problem most people don't have. It got more attention than it was supposed. To. <laughs> it yeah, less attention. Uh, so, what kind of attention did it get? I'm um, really so from just from memory alone, uh, the first issue I posted on the internet started getting traction by, I posted it on Twitter and started getting shared by uh, industry professionals from America and, and England. Wow. And at a fast rate, like I posted it on, in the afternoon. By the time I was home 30 minutes later, I was receiving messages from people who, whose work I had been reading for years who were like, this is great, keep going. And I'm like, how? Uh, how, and, yeah, how? Yeah, and, and like, and because Kugali needed content, um, we, like I gave them the stuff and, and they use it for their, um, what's that, what are they called again? Uh, anthologies. And it started getting, it started getting um, articles. And I think there was a BBC, uh, the BBC News about us as well, where my ad was animated. Like there were there were panels of Kane and Ebony that were animated specifically for that. Uh, so yeah, it, it grew really quickly. Like I started receiving messages from people who were like, I really like this book. When's the next one? Uh, I, I found articles about that series specifically. And and when it's something that you're literally just making because you're out of school and you're trying to learn how to do the how to do the craft. It's really nice, but it also it's kind of scary because it was just supposed to be a test until you get to the actual thing you're working on. So because I didn't want, I knew Jelly I was coming and I, I was getting back to it. So I didn't want Kane and Ebony to take too much of the thunder away from it, especially because Kane and Ebony was ending anyway. So I, I, I put a stop to that. The same way that uh, I gave them a bunch of Monkey Meat comics that I also made just because I felt like making short stories with fun stuff in them. And, and now I'm reworking the concept into something more 
tangible um, that I'm working on by myself with a publisher that um, understands the, the 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 like gives me all my rights basically. Okay. That's that's an amazing story. It teaches me that you know if there is art is really easy to see. Like you see the value of it when you just look at it. It's not a book when you have to read it for like a few minutes to a few hours to 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 get what it is. Um, and it goes today with social networks. It could go, it doesn't, or usually doesn't go, around the world in half an hour. Mm. And uh, I, that's an amazing story. I yeah, really, I mean, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, was, I was just going to say I'm really lucky. That, yeah, but it's also the, the, the use of talent. It's, it's the, not the use of talent. It's the uh, recognition of talent. When it, the, mm. Your things really pop out with uh, a lot of talent, but also a lot of backstory. These things have a history. And you're yeah. using uh, ancient images on top of modern images to create something new, which is... Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would like to talk like about the aesthetics of, uh, uh, of everything. Let's like, um, of G uh, uh, Jelia, for example, like there are so many things in it drawn from so many different types of things. And how, like, what is the story behind them? Um, so basically, when I started working on this, like even way before, uh, I worked on the aesthetic first. Yeah, uh, yeah I have a cat. Uh, I, I I worked on the aesthetic first. That was because, your cat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I thought it was my cat trying to get. <laughs> from me. Yeah. So so I, I started working on the aesthetic at first because I wanted to, to get the world right. Before I started caring about like what the stories were gonna, were gonna be, I needed to get the aesthetics and the world right. Like what kind of world would be, and I I sort of just made a fantasy version of the city I grew up in. So I would just make that city, except you would have robots and and uh, talking animals and flying boats and 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 machines and everything and magic. Um, and the aesthetic just came from sort of a mix of what you would find in your typical um, African folk tales um, and what you would find in cartoons. I really use a lot of cartoon logic in the way I do things. Because like, I, I find that folk tales and cartoons have the similar thing where they can be logical and kind of weird and do things that don't make sense. But it works either because it's a cartoon or in the case of folk tales, because it's a story told through voice or text, you can get away with a lot of stuff. Like the story of uh, the rabbit that crawls into a hole to visit an, a human woman and he makes a baby with her. Like that, 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 how that, that doesn't work, that doesn't make any sense, but it's a folk tale. So you don't even question necessarily the thing. Um, so yeah, so I, I tried to use that same type of logic. And once I was, it was also about learning the shapes, like what kind of shapes do different African arts have? What kind of colors do they use? Um, essentially learning a visual language. And once I had a good enough visual library, I started thinking about the kind of stories that I wanted to do with that. Um, and so Delia is kind of the product of me uh, creating a world and figuring out what kind of stories I wanted to do in it. Uh, so a lot of stuff is pulled from specific cultures, has a specific meaning, and I try to stay as close as I can to the meaning that it has in real life. And Sometimes each culture is a different aesthetic too. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, one thing that we have now that we maybe didn't have a few generations before is that because of the way the world is now where people travel a lot and where the diaspora is, African, African people share a lot of different things. So you can be Senegalese and have a Ghanaian uh, clothes or listen to Nigerian music, or you, you know, there's a lot of mixing that goes on. And 
it sort of makes things easier for me as well because that means that I can pull from different cultures and make things work together in a way that feels natural because the real world is already doing it. Why is that? Why is, I, I think that's something unique to Africa, uh, that, that sort of mixing. And mm -hmm. Is it because the borders are just arbitrary, like they were given by the Europeans, I think? Or is yeah. It else? Um, I think it ties a bit into it. The, the, um, basically, there was this real push after the, the independence movement to sort of try to reclaim a sort of African identity. And so many rulers at the time and many thinkers from Africa tried even to sort of create a sort of pan-African nation throughout the whole continent. They tried to create a union. They, they tried a bunch of different things. And there is a bit of an, there is an, a sense of an African identity that didn't exist before colonization. And a lot of it is due to common um, grief and suffering and, and common history with the same invaders. Yeah. Um, and also the fact that communities that did not communicate much with each other or were at war with each other or had different relationships suddenly found themselves under the control of one Afro European ruler uh, in, in borders that were decided completely arbitrarily by according to the needs of someone else. So suddenly you're told that you're part of a nation where the village next to yours who from populated with people who speak a different language suddenly you are told that they are the same nation as you and and, and it, it does create a sort of like sense of brotherhood i guess it, it creates tensions as well like there, there is a number of wars and stuff that were that were generated by the fact that certain peoples were not uh getting along well with each other at all um but there was also a sort of sense of brotherhood that started creating because people started sharing things. And, and the result we have now is that, especially with the internet, like Kugali is a really good example of it. The, the, the fact that you ha can have so many different people from different countries who all have their specific African cultures, but we have shared bits and pieces in Africa itself, but we also all grew up with uh, American and Japanese media. So we have common grounds that we can use. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting puzzle to me because it is completely different attitude from European and Asians and Americans. Yeah. And, uh, um, all right, so it is my, my great fascination is, is double and I'm, I'm almost, I almost got most of it. So one of it was um, the uniqueness that you wanted to insert into your uh, uh, art, which is uh, Afri you know, African folk tales. Uh -huh. and, and we, because most people don't write about it and certainly don't write about it like that. And that thing is not found in comics in the way that you did it. Uh -huh. And you did find a way to make it both modern and old at the same time. Um, yeah. And I really wanted, I think there is a growing uh, both attention and need in the world for non-American stories, for stories that come from all different types of, uh, uh, um, uh, sometimes I forget words, of, um, so it's not what I'm looking for, but different kinds of societies and all yeah. kinds of different uh, uh, places and pasts and attitudes. And um, I think I think bringing that to people is really uh, it's both important, but I think people want to see it too. Mm. Used to be that people just wanted to see Hollywood, for example, in movies and television. Uh, and I think that's changing. Yeah. Comic books, they wanted to see just Marvel and DC and, you know, the basic superheroes. Mm -hmm. and I think it is changing. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's, there seems to be a lot more, um, I think because people have sort of had the same diet for so long, they sort of want to change. Yeah. And the most obvious thing you have is 
pulling from cultures that you didn't know anything about before. And there's also the added effect of the, the, the whole um, people are trying to sort of make up for past wrongs that were done to different people around the world. So there is this push to like almost, it's almost a political stance to 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 want to read or watch stories from from cultures that you didn't know before. Uh, it's almost a sort of a way to, to make up for for the fact that they were so ostracized. So it's, yeah, it's as I as I read Jelly, I actually remember that uh, my grand my grandfather became uh, an author at age seventy. Uh, he started with an autobiography because. Which was really political about stuff uh, I did uh, during childhood, and then uh, there was fiction. He wrote fiction, three books based on uh, myths, which are not was Jewish, but not Jewish myths, but uh, Middle Eastern myths mm. in the same style. It didn't take stuff, but and it was a very political story, uh, very political mm. stories, and I made a show on that. It, uh, uh, in the theater about that. And that, it sounded like it's a very similar thing. We use folk tales to tell something new. Yeah. To the roots uh, of the story. And the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, which again, I think we've almost uh, uh, reached. By the way, can, can I ask you about the uh, tattoos? What do they mean? <laughs> it's uh, Woodstock, the bird from Peanuts. Oh, what is he doing? Is it like the path he was taking? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have it. Uh, I have uh, the whole, like the way he flies, he, he doesn't fly straight. That's right. You know, like so, that. so the way, the way, the, the way Schultz drew it, he did little dashes. So I have all the dashes around my arm and, and the bird on my wrist. And why did you choose to have Woodstock? Um... Because when I was a teenager, I had a um, phase of really difficult uh, emotional management, I guess. Like a lot, a lot, of, a lot of pain and, and problems of self-esteem and stuff like that. And that book was one of the big reasons why I wasn't so, I didn't feel so alone. Like it, it, it felt like it was written by someone who kind of understood what it was like to feel inadequate, to feel sad and alone and, and misunderstood and everything. And, and it was like, it's, it helped me a lot. So mm. when, when I, when I decided to get a tattoo, I decided it would be something from the peanuts. And I chose Woodstock because I think he's, he's, he's my favorite iconography from the book. Amazing. So the other thing <laughs> I cut myself off, the other thing <laughs> uh, I wanted to cover was your path, which we, we covered up to now. So you have become, you now have steady jobs uh, or yeah. job requests from really big companies, DC and Boom and, you know. Mm. Uh, and how, how do you see us? And you also, you said you're working on another project. Yeah. Um, which I haven't, it hasn't been announced yet. So I'm supposed yeah. to stick quiet, but um yeah, the plan, I guess, is to keep on doing what I'm doing now, which is to be able to work on my things, my, my own projects, without, which are taking most of my time, and being able to have short jobs for other publishers, uh, mostly because I, I think I have a bit of a short attention span. Like I'm not, I'm not the kind of person who can be on a, a run of the same thing for 50 issues. I can't do it. I just don't have the patience for that. I'm going to get bored of it. Um, so being able to work on my own stories and do 10 pages here, 30 pages there, a cover for this one, uh, that's a system that I really like because it gives me a, a diversity of different subjects of stuff to do. So I'm never bored. Uh, and it also allows me to um, touch different audiences as well because you don't necessarily touch the same people. And like the first DC story I did, it was really nice to see the reactions of people who were reading it and found it nice and, and, and shared pictures on, on the internet. And like I was on Twitter and I saw someone using one of my Robin drawings as a, as a profile picture. 
And I, that, that's really nice. I really like that. <laughs> so yeah, th that system works well for me. And for, for the time being, that's what I'm seeing myself uh, doing. That's nice. Okay. Uh, was there, did anyone from television or movies approach you about uh, Julia? Uh, um, there's been, there's been not offers, but like manifestations of interest, uh, which we'll see. I have no idea. Like I, the book just came out. Yeah. Um, so everything is very early stuff. Um, and I sort of try to approach it in a sort of, um, the book is the book. If something else is made out of it, it's going to be something else. It is. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to bother myself too much with it. But it's true that it's not going to be the same. They're not going to take the same text and do the same exact mm -hmm. structure, but they're going to need your rights. You're going to say yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm going yeah. To say yeah. And there will be more awareness made to uh, your comic books, I'm guessing. Yeah. Which is always nice. So yeah, we'll see yeah. what happens. Yeah. Okay, good luck. Good luck with that. <laughs> is there anything else you want people to, uh, to know about that we didn't cover? Um, no, I think, yes. I, I think we're good. The, the <coughs> right, right now, things are calm. I'm enjoying the peace. So, yeah. Nice. Like, get, get jelly. Yeah. I think it's good. <laughs> yes, it is. It's really, it's fantastic. It, it will blow your mind. And it's <laughs> a visual adventure.